Today, I've got two special guests on part of the system, Maxine Parker and Judy O'Connor from Access Ability Australia, otherwise known as AAA. With over 30 years experience in working with disability education and community with children and adults, both Maxine and Judy have a wealth of experience and knowledge working in this space. Now, Maxine has a hearing impairment and Judy is a parent of a child with disability. They've created a wonderful organisation called Accessibility Australia. Now, Accessibility Australia was the 2020 Victorian Disability Sport and Recreation Award winner in the Initiative of the Year category. And the organisation is taking the, the leisure industry by storm um, and councils are engaging AAA to develop the access key, unlocking facilities, making them more accessible. So we're going to dig into a little bit about what the access key is shortly. But Maxine and Judy, how are you? Good. Thanks for having us. <laughs> happy yeah. 30th. Yeah. Yes, happy 30th. This is the 30th episode, so a special one. And uh, yeah, really chuffed to, to have you both on. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll dig straight into it. So what does well-being mean to you both? Oh, you go um, first, Judy. Oh, okay. So these are questions. This was a hard one for me because I guess um, it was sort of to really think about it. And I guess I'm, I guess I'm a busy person, but sort of being put on the spot with well-being for me. Um, I guess on a personal note, it's about. I think it's something that you move naturally towards and you've got to give yourself time to do that. Um, and we, we've we had a tough, like many people, um, a tough 18 months. Um, Maxine and I both professionally, not so much, but on personal notes, um, I lost my mum. Maxine's mum's become very unwell. And I heard a young girl um, say one day, you can't wait for bad things to end to be happy. So I guess I think about that because mm. nobody knows what's around the corner. Yeah. So I guess it's about mindfulness um, and I think you naturally move towards things that you value most. I do anyway. And the things I value most are happiness because when you're happy, you learn, and that's what I tell my boys. Um, and being with my family, with my friends, I have a wonderful business partner who's a very good friend of mine. There you go, Maxine. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to say it again, all right? <laughs> it's okay. it's you okay. won't be able to see her on the screen. It's okay. It's recorded, so I've got it. <laughs> yeah. That's it. And I think to me it's about being authentic yeah. and just being happy. And like I said, I think that opens you up to lots of great things in your life. So that would be my well-being, yeah, my great. personal well-being, yeah. And what about you, Maxine? So um, probably a little more unlike Judy, um, and that's why we make such wonderful business partners because we are the complete opposite, chalk and cheese. Yeah. Um, look, when it comes to my well-being, I'm very much more structured. Mm. Um, I very much sort of tailor myself a well-being program, if you like, yeah. um, and it, it really does relate more so around equilibrium um, sorry, just one sec. My emails are on. I need to switch those off. Bear with me for one second. Okay, sorry about that. They're popping in on the screen. Um, yeah, so look, it's very much for me around um, making sure that my needs are met on a uh, physical, mental, emotional and spiritual level um, each and every single day. Wow. Um, and I very much plan for that. Okay. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. So, and, and just picking up what you're both saying there, Judy, I, I love the fact that you were saying, you know, you can't wait to, to, to be happy. You know, there's always things yeah. that are going to be popping up, you know, and um, mm. you just have to kind of, yeah, work work through it as best you can. And Maxine, yeah. for you, it's really about preparing every day to, to yeah. make sure that, um, you know, you give yourself the best chance to look after your well-being. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Definitely. And tell me about the role of accessibility in um, Australia in the in the sports industry, then, because um, yeah, tell us about, what what's the story? How did you guys come together? 
Oh, do you ah. want to start? <laughs> oh, like, no. sure. Look, I, I can start on basically how we came together. So Judy and I met um, seven years ago now. Oh, probably actually a little bit more further back than that. Yeah. Um, around eight years ago. Well, we were both working within the educational sector and yeah. we were supporting students on the program for disability. Um, and we began working together um, on a speech therapy program uh, where I was actually helping to um, train Judy on that particular program. And we really hit it off so, so well, um, connected both professionally and personally. And we just sort of realised we had something really good going between the two of us. Mm-hmm. And it sort of stemmed from there. And, um, you know, um, later on down the track, we sort of both went our separate ways, but we sort of really never properly separated because we constantly kept in touch with all these wonderful ideas. And and that's really where the access key concept was born because mm-hmm. we sort of got our heads together and realised, hey, we've both been doing this for years but we never really actually had a name for what we were doing we were just doing it Mm -hmm. um preparing the students judy was preparing her son who has disability to do um, different activities within community and we just thought we've got such a good concept here let's just see where we can go with it Mm -hmm. and that's really how it came about Mm. yeah fantastic so there's definitely (laughs) an alchemy a magic between you um which you you, you're saying that, you know, you're both, um, you're quite different, but, you know, what you bring together is is something special. And yeah. it, Judy, did you want to say anything? Uh, I was going to say, I think our, our core values are the same. And I think that's the same in any any relationship, no matter how different you are. Mm. Uh, Maxine and I both share a very um, wicked sense of humour. So that gets <laughs> us through most things. And um, we find each other hilarious. <laughs> just ask us, you know, we just think we're the funniest people. Um, and that helps a lot because, yeah. you know, nobody's got to, you know, if you can have your sense of humour, I think mm. it's a gift. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. was there anything like the the access key before? And, like, tell us, a, tell us a little bit about what the access key is. Yeah, so our keys are about i guess if if we start back from the beginning with my little boy james mm. okay when he was 3 years old he was di- diagnosed with a- autism mm-hmm. um james also has an intellectual disability mm. and um sensory processing disorder mm-hmm. so as a mother i guess like any mother um who on that first diagnosis you do go through quite a long period of grief And I don't think it ever goes away. And anyway, so I wanted, I also had an older son who's now 19 and he also is on the spectrum, Um, but we didn't really know that till very recently. Um, So I think what it was, when the NDIS came through and it was all around getting people out into the community, supporting them to live their best lives. And that that was such a wonderful thing, and I I very personally uh, benefited a lot from the NDIS, um, and so is my son. His life has changed for the better, and so was ours. But at the time, the anxiety, my anxiety, and James's anxiety around getting out the front door was quite high. So that's when Max, like Max said before, I was making access keys. They weren't called access keys back then. Um, with, you know, instructions from speech therapists, occupational therapists, and I think access keys for me were born um, to get us out and to visit some places um, confidently, um, successfully, because we had times where we would go somewhere and, you know, Nick would have been about um, seven or eight and so excited to be going somewhere and we get there and James just could not handle it. So a lot of the times for me it was about pre-visiting places, taking photos in the back of my mind, am I doing more harm than good, oh, my God, and then nights um, at the computer making all these different little stories for James, I suppose, that you could call them, Um, even going to a new doctor's surgery or a new dentist, Um, even if he wasn't the... um, the patient he was coming with me so I spent a lot of time away from the family preparing James and I wanted to when Max and I got together I really wanted to give the gift of time to parents like me 
and that's where it really started. So I think I've gone off the track to your question. No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely on that's track. That's why I have to write things down because that's just me typically. <laughs> no, you're absolutely on track. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the key thing for there, and I've heard you talk about this before, is giving parents and carers the gift of time. Yeah. You know, because what you were doing them in their early days is providing, you know, developing all those resources and visuals so you could give your child, you know, um, you know, the the opportunity to, to to be aware of what 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 they're getting, you know, what they're going to be experiencing. So it's, yes. it's you know, making them more comfortable, um, yeah. which I think which I think is fantastic. So it's it's so so it came from a gap then that you saw within, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah very much so. So it was all wonderful. Um, that the NDIS was giving us almost like a power to get out and about, you know, it, yeah. it, and something, you know, a lot of families like mine grappled with because we've never, ha- never had it before. Mm. Um, so, I want, yeah, Max and I wanted to fill this void. So to support people at home before they went out and then whilst they're out and to make sure that venues suit their individual needs. So it's not just for a person on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's for people who may use a wheelchair, people who have um, cerebral palsy, um, intellectual disability, even like that's the core part of Access Keys was to support people with disability. Mm -hmm. But as we've moved on through the years, it suits it, they suit anyone. Like we've had parents with prams ring us and say, oh, it's wonderful, we know where the prams are. Um, some elderly members of the community, um, they love it because their anxiety is high. Like they can wor- they may worry about things like where am I going to put my walker when I get there? Yeah. You know, they seem simple to us, but not when you're elderly and frail. So... So with it, with so with it then, because uh, it's like a frontline service. So it could be a library, or it could be you know um, uh, a, a leisure centre. Re- yeah, yeah. exactly. Could be a zoo, couldn't it? Could be anything. Yeah. When somebody's yeah. so take me through the process of um, when an organisation engages AAA to develop an access key. Go, Max. I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, look, it starts um, at the very beginning, obviously, with just a a preliminary discussion around the challenges that each organisation is facing in terms of their access inclusion and how our services can really help them. Um, So, generally, that can be a face-to-face meeting. These days, it can be online. Um, We much prefer face-to-face because we really like to build those relationships with our clients, but, you know, it is the times that it is. Um, So then after that, once we sort of established where those challenges lay, um, it's a matter of moving forward with the project. And that's when we come together with key stakeholders within the actual organisation that we've been commissioned by. Let's just say, for example, it's a a leisure and rec centre. Mm. Um, More often than not, we're commissioned by a local government organisation to develop the access key for the centre. However, we may also be working in conjunction with the operators of that centre. That may be the likes of Belgravia or YMCA, um, organisations like that. So what we do is we all come together, we determine who the key stakeholders in the project are going to be, we draw up some proposed timelines, we look at, um, you know, what that looks like, who takes responsibility of which area of the project um, and how long we're going to span this out for, what's doable for each working party, in other words. Uh, We're very flexible in how we work. So sometimes a project can take us, you know, 30 days to um, from start to finish and other times it can span over three to six months. It really depends upon the organisation um, and the time frame and the commitment that they have to put into it at the time. Um, so then basically um, the artwork um, stage of the project commences where we gather um, logos and style guides so that the access key is fully branded in accordance with the facility that we are working with. That's really important um, in terms of ownership for the organisation we're working with, but also for the actual user of the resource, because it's the actual branding of the centre that they're going to that they most recognise. And so it's really important for it to be branded accordingly. 
Um, we have um, an amazing team that works so closely with us. So Jenny, our access key assessor, will make a time with clients, um, pop out to the facility, um, we'll do a full on-site assessment. Um, our occupational therapist, Richie, that you've also met, David, he's my wonderful, um, fabulous, talented son. Now, I'm not biased <laughs> at all. <laughs> no. no. Um, yeah, he, he may also pop along, um, but his role definitely um, comes into play a little bit further down the line um, in the project. And once we have done our on-site assessment, which is really just a sit-down interview um, with those key stakeholders, having a good look at those challenges, how we can help overcome those challenges with information in the access key for the user, and then staying on site. And we do a lot of um, assessment work in terms of environmental specs. Um, for example, we'll go into the accessible toilets and we'll measure everything that we can possibly measure in that toilet cubicle, from the cubicle space to the heart of the sink, the heart of the tap, the heart of the toilet, transfer direction, all really critical information for a person with disability to know, particularly if the disability is physical. Um, so then um, once we've done all of that, uh, we make another time for our uh, wonderful photographer, Nita, who has worked with us for quite some time now, to go out and capture the images to support the access key information. So she'll pop along um, on site. And I know, David, you've had some great experience in the access key development process through the work we've done together at Ganyama. So um, you'll understand how all this works. Um, so the photographer comes out, does the photo shoot, then um, the compilation work really commences. So basically um, we have the artwork, it's all been signed off by council, but generally by their comms team. We then begin the population. So that's when the content from the assessor goes into the artwork. That's when the images from Nita goes into the artwork. Judy and I spend a lot of time together in front of four different screens. Um, looking at all of this in fine detail, Judy has a screen probably the size of, gee, I don't know, <laughs> how, how large is your screen these days, Judy? I, I don't know, know, but it's, uh, it's very big. I love it. <laughs> it's unreal. It's a huge, huge, big screen. We've but got it's... a tiny little office that kind of takes up a wall. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. 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 It's, it's actually really important for the role yeah. um, that Judy plays in this because she's very much heavily um, involved in the graphic design side of the um, access key. Yeah. Um, and there's so much fine detail that goes into the graphic design side of things. So it's really imperative for Judy to have have that um, have that lens, which is great. Um, and then once Judy and I have done the compilation side of the work, we then actually get together with our speech pathologist and our occupational therapist, and that's when we do a full review of the content. Now, the speech pathologist will look at it in terms of the language, um, the flow, the grammar. Um, she's definitely our grammar Nazi. Um, yeah. Yeah, procedural language, um, easy English, and Richie ROT looks at it through, again, the lens of a person with disability who would be attending this particular leisure centre. Mm -hmm. What are their needs? Have we covered everything? Can we add some further information? He looks over the sensory guides with a fine tooth comb. Mm -hmm. So the sensory guides are the sensory elements of the experience at the leisure centre. And again, really important for a person who has sensory processing disorder or a person such as myself who has sensory impairment mm -hmm. um, really helps us prepare um, before we go for any sorts of triggers. Um, and then once we have all that signed off, um, we generally will send a draft to all of the key stakeholders where they will collaborate and they will get back to us with feedback. And um, that process, um, generally, we have around three submissions per project, um, give or take, um, and each of us will look over it, give feedback, look over it, give feedback and so mm -hmm. forth till we're happy with the final product um, and that's when it's published. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And uh, just picking up on your point around, you know, the measurement of taps and, you mm. know, um, all these little, little tiny details that maybe, you know, somebody like myself or, uh, you know, you know, an average person wouldn't necessarily think is important, but but these fine details to, to somebody maybe who's, you know, partially sight, sighted or blind, they're so important, aren't they? So, you know, it's it's making sure that, um, 
you know, and anybody that's coming to these facilities is it's completely, uh, you know, inclusive for them and accessible. And yeah. picking up what you were saying there around, or you know, your team. So you've got a pathologist, you've got a you've got an occupational therapist, you know, you've got um, you've got somebody who's looking after the design, and uh, it seems like you've you've really grown and um, to 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 provide that professional and personalised access key. Um, how, how many access keys are out there? Ooh. <laughs> I actually tried to do a count the other day, Max, and I yeah. sort of, as usual, got distracted. <laughs> um. What, with your big screen there? Surely not. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, no excuses whatsoever. No, I think I've no. around 75, but we have so many yeah. more. Um, three quarters. We've got of a big backlog, backlog, yeah, which is great. Yeah. We've just unfortunately been held up with publication due to COVID. Um, yeah. But we do have a big backlog, and the majority of the backlog is actually for sport and recreational centres. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. That's great. And what have been some of the challenges then that you've experienced in developing uh, some of the access keys? What have you found? Oh, look, to be honest, we um, we have been so, so fortunate in the people that we have worked with. Um, they have truly embraced the concept. Um, they're working with us. Oh, hello, there's somebody in the screen. Yes, I've got <laughs> my back, but James is here. Hello, hello James. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. No problem. Keep going. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're very, very fortunate to work with such wonderful people and um, who share very similar values to ourselves. Council yeah. have a, a majority of our client co cohort is local government. Mm -hmm. um, and local government now are developing some amazing policy and framework around community inclusion. Yeah. Um, so we're so, so fortunate um, to be able to work with those organisations. And, look, I really think... Um, for us, it's always about the core, the core of our business and the why of our business. Yes. And like Judy mentioned earlier before, when we first started, it was about supporting people with disability. And that very much is still the core of our, of our mm. business and our, and our purpose. Mm. Um, it's just expanded beyond that. But with that in mind, I think what we have to always be mindful of is drawing ourselves back to that core purpose mm. because it's so easy to get carried away on site. Yeah. Yes. The amazing amount of offerings that facilities have, we could turn these access keys into a full encyclopedia. It could yeah. be, you know, in excess easily of 100 pages, but we yeah. must draw it back always to the core purpose and the audience it's intended for. I really like that. It's that it's that clarity, isn't it? And you know, mm. star about what you're about. And I know I'm experiencing that in my business as well. It's yeah. it's you know, mm. you really need to think about that alignment. And very much. I, I, I was I was actually listening to one of your YouTube clips uh, this morning as I was walk, <laughs> walk, walking around the park, and uh, I think Judy, you said that ninety percent of disability is invisible. Like mm. you know, you. And I was thinking about it, and yeah. Obviously, it's, you know, if somebody's a person in a wheelchair, it's, it's easy to see, isn't it, in terms yeah. of that physical disability. Um, yeah. How, how because I suppose with the access key and the whole process of it, the training that has to go along with it for staff, um, you know, to make, it really shines a light on that kind of aspect as well. Do you, yeah. do, do you guys do training with, with, with the teams that you work with? Um, uh, when, we, when we do... Um, when we send off the final draft of the access key um, to our client, it goes with it with the email goes a small tutorial that is sent out to staff. So it's only around 15 minutes, really mm -hmm. easy to understand and follow. Doesn't take up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So it's really good if staff know that centres have an access key. Currently, we're working on some marketing material. Um, for centres, so they will have signage and things like that. So ask us about our access key. Mm. Um, and I guess there's nothing worse than asking a staff member, tell us about your access key, where can I get it? Oh, what's that? Exactly. You know, so um, we try and educate not just because sometimes we work purely with council mm. and we have very brief conversations with um 
centre and often we go in, Jenny will go in and say, so why are you guys here for an access key assessment? We're here for an access key assessment. Oh, can you quickly go over what that is? And that could be like a team of three people. So we found as the business has developed that this little staff training tool yeah. has been um, really well, you know, received well received. Sorry, I've got a bit going on here in the background. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I think you know we try and make things as easy as possible for our clients and to disperse yeah. the information. And I think like when we talk about, you know, I know you're probably going to ask this a little bit later on, but how can we improve access and inclusion in the industry? I think it's about people need to let people know what they've got. So these centres have amazing programs. They have amazing facilities. They have changing places. They have quiet rooms. They have, they'll turn the music down if you ask. You know, it's really, it's really important to let this cohort of clients know that. It's so important and to make it easy. And I, I think with, Yes, we um, do access keys, but then we market. You know, we've got a really good reach to people who live in the disability sector, who work in the disability sector. So we let them know that what the our clients have these amazing facilities and that the people are welcome no matter what their ability. And I think also, you know, it's also around creating awareness so sport and recreation isn't just for able-bodied mentally stabled young people it's for everybody and I hope that's what our access keys not only help people with disability but educate mm. people who you know aren't as fortunate as me who not only live not only lives with you know, in the disability sector, I work in it as well. So yeah, yeah. I think yeah. also, David, like you mentioned, you know, things that we so take for granted, the measurement of environmental specs, for example, in a bathroom, mm. until you look at an access key, you actually don't think about that information if you're a fully able-bodied mm. person um, because why would you need to know that information? Mm. So it may even be, for example, a mother who's going into a facility that has twins in a large pram and she needs to be able to turn that camera around when she gets into that facility um so you know it really does um encompass such a large audience and so i think the access key in itself is a wonderful tutorial for staff working in centers yeah. um the other offering that we do have is communication access and awareness training um so that's um an online training can also be delivered face to face um so again this is around equipping the frontline people who are working in the centers with skills and knowledge around communication challenges and how to confidently communicate with people who may come through their doors who will have a communication challenge. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right in terms of what you were saying there. It's, it's education. Yeah, mm, very, very much. much so. Yeah. And councils have got an obligation, haven't they, in terms of their disability inclusion action plans to, yes. to, to, to provide access to people with disability. So I think what the access key does is, is absolutely provides that um, in, in being able to unlock these facilities. Yeah. But you're not just in leisure, are you? So I think <laughs> that's the other, the other thing to this. And, yeah. um, you know, I think you're in libraries as well, but of them 70 facilities, um, yeah, what's the split between the different kind of uh, venues that you're operating in and um, what are your aspirations for the future? Yeah, so look, we've probably got a fairly even split in terms of the centres showcased in Access Keys. We would love more tourism operators to come on board um, because when we're looking at the NDIS and let's just say, for example, we're thinking about um, day service providers and they're looking for places constantly to take their clients to. Yeah. Rec centres are fantastic, but yeah. not everybody wants to visit a rec centre. Um, mm -hmm. You know, libraries are fantastic. Again, you know, great activity perhaps for the winter or for 40-degree days. Um, but, you know, 
not everybody is going to spend five days a week in a library. It's really great to be yeah. able to offer that diversification in mm -hmm. our resource. Um, so we would love more tourism operators to come on board. We do already have some. Um, but with the NDIS now, and as Judy mentioned before, participants of NDIS now, they have the power to make choices. Yeah. They 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 are more funded they have the autonomy it's really about that missing piece of the puzzle to help them get out the door and to understand the facilities that are available to them mm. so currently you know we do have some diversification in the resource um, we do have libraries we do have theaters cultural centers neighborhood houses um, we have uh, tourism operators we have sport and rec leisure facilities we have some medical clinics um, we've had events in the past as well. Hopefully, once uh, we get through these yeah. difficult COVID times, we'll have some yeah. more events. Right. So people um, engage you for an event that they're doing then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We've had our events. We've had quite a few different festivals. We've had the carols by candlelight and the Maya Music Bowl on Christmas Here in Eve. Melbourne. Oh. Yeah. In Melbourne. Yeah. So. Um, yep. And, you know, access keys um, can be customised for any sort of experience or event. Um, mm. I think you also asked about aspirations, didn't you, David, for the access key? And this is something that Judy and I um, have had a pipe dream for basically since um, the beginning of access keys since they were born. And it's really around having some sort of um, recognised national accreditation around an access key and a facility showcased in an access key and showing to the wider community that that facility is welcoming and inclusive of every single person within community. Mm. That that would be yeah. our aspiration for yeah. access keys. Mm. Yeah, without oh. a doubt. I actually think that's achievable <laughs> uh, for, for you guys. I think you're on yeah. the path, path to it and, you know, yeah. whether it's mandatory, like you said, and, and really that stamp of approval that these facilities are inclusive and welcoming, yeah. um, I think would be would be fantastic. And yeah. if we if we just link it back to chronic conditions, I know we've talked a lot about disability, but as you'll be aware, one in two Australians have, have got a chronic condition and um, it doesn't seem to be getting any better, unfortunately. So if we could nudge one part of the system to improve the well-being of Australians, um, what could that be? Mm. I, I mean, look, for me, I kind of take it back to the why. Why mm. is it so? Is it due to barriers and we know that we know that without a doubt we know that from being immersed within the system ourselves personally and professionally we know there are barriers to participation and we're certainly hoping through the work we're doing and through the work that so many orga many organizations are doing such as your own David we're breaking those barriers down which is wonderful um, unfortunately it's not enough it's mm. not enough and it's not going to be um, the the fix for everything long term. It certainly is a, a piece to the puzzle. Um, I guess um, for me, I, I think it probably comes back down to that education and awareness as well. And, you know, because we are working with so many local government organisations and um, facilities and the operators of those facilities, what I'd love to see is a connection, more of a connection between those organisations where we can get some programs out there, perhaps to some service providers, engage the local providers, get them into the centres, creating some educational pieces around health, hygiene, wellbeing, and then also some physical activity because they're already in the centre. So creating yeah. some programs around that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would have yeah. to agree there, especially with organisations like WeFlex. Yes. Yeah. I know you had Tommy on. Um, yeah. So um, when we think about capacity building and things like that, a lot of people have sport and wellbeing in their plans, their NDIS plans. Mm. So to have that extra support once you get into um, a sport and rec centre, I think that would be, um, yeah, awesome. I know from my point of view, my son needs one-on-one -on -one support. And to have that, that and you know, unfortunately, disability um, sport isn't 
Um, they're not, I think that's one of the hardest things to get into because, yeah, I don't, I don't know. From my point of view, it is. Um, mm. I find it difficult to get my son out even for a walk. Mm. So, and, you know, the screen time and things like that. So I think it needs, sport needs to be, from my point of view only, um, more sport in SDS environments and special schools. Mm. Yeah, more physical activity, I would think, where possible. Whether you're, you know, whether you use a wheelchair, I think there's always, you know, more physiotherapy and things like that in schools. Yeah. I just think just also that a more, more person-centred approach and a more yeah. holistic approach, that more mm. systematic approach, collaborating. I mean, collaboration is key, isn't it? Let's face yeah. it. And we've had so much success with organisations that we collaborate with. Mm. Um, you know, we've engaged the services of subject matter experts in so many different areas of disability to enhance and bring so much more value into the work that we do. Yeah. Um, so getting out there and having that holistic approach um, to that education and awareness and bringing those cohorts of clients into these facilities where we already know they're welcoming, we already know they're inclusive. Um, let's expand on that and enhance yeah. on that and make it better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, fantastic. And stronger together, isn't it? Indeed. Yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. Bring, bring it, bring it yeah. working, working in collaboration, as, as yeah. you're saying, and um, looking yeah. at the whole of person. Um, yes kind of approach but physical activity is the golden thread I think mm. uh, yeah. you know um, in terms of improving people's Spoke, uh, spoken well-being. like a true Iron Man there David yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, an amateur an amateur <laughs> yeah and I think the authenticity what comes across from you too is because you've had that lived experience and you know you've worked in the sector of disability for such a long time and you bring all that together um and obviously have a bit of fun along the way with it. Uh, um, but where where do you guys see you, yourselves personally in the system and, and how, how do you contribute and influence it? This was a hard one for me um, when I got this question. And I, think I, I think I could tell you what I think it is already, but anyway, I'd love to oh, hear your thoughts. Go for it, no, please no, do. Go on, Judy, go on. <laughs> I think it's more, uh, for me, I think I'll always be an advocate. Um, for people who live with disability and I'll always be an educator to organisations and for people who are unfortunately not in the system. So, um, yeah, I'm just a, a big believer in authenticity and all people everywhere. That is my mantra um, and I think uh, I, I find it hard because I'm trying to be politically correct a lot too these days and I never know what words to use sometimes, to be honest. I, I, lo um, I, lo I, loved your, I love your honesty there. Um, yeah, with, with and, I, you know, I, tr I try really, really hard not to offend people and <laughs> I don't know if anyone's, I'm very nervous in these types of situations as well. So, um, but... I think for me and my little boy and the way my family is, I think if we can all get out there in community, it's it's not a big deal, you know. It can't be a big deal. Um, I I've been through situations where my eldest son has been, you know, so upset that people are looking at my our little boy, and you know, and I would all always say to people. You know, just ask. Come and ask. Come and speak to us. You know, speak to James. He's an absolutely lovely child mm -hmm. and loves people. So just because he makes different noises and he may behave differently, he wants what everybody else wants. So, um, yeah, that's what I, awareness, um, you know, families like mine, you know, we're normal. We have different challenges. No one's perfect. So, that would be my yeah. if I answered yeah. that okay. Yeah, do yeah. brilliant, you know, yeah. educate and advocate and Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like you said, just just for people to come and have a chat, you know, instead oh, of Oh, definitely. When you're out and about, just yeah. come and say hi, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love great. talking about my boys. <laughs> I know you do. I know I you do. do. <laughs> and uh, why not? Because they're amazing. And, oh, um, they are. I'm very proud. I'm a very lucky person and grateful every day. Oh, beautiful. And what about you, Maxine? 
Um, look, you know, for myself, my um, first experience of disability stemmed way back um, to my early 20s when um, I met my cousin for the first time who lives in the UK who has cerebral palsy. And um, what an absolutely wonderful individual he is and remains to be this day. Um, one of my closest family members, one of my best friends. Um, I was doing some volunteer work at his school at the time. That was my very first experience of disability. And I had reached my early 20s before I had that experience. Ever since that day, I too, like Judy, have been an extremely strong advocate for people with disability. Um, he has been very much a driving force all of my life. Uh, well, not all of my life, since since the, my early 20s, since I first met him. He was a lot younger than myself. Um, and I continued on that path, working within a community with people with disability, working within the educational sector, every opportunity I could possibly um, get to connect with people with disability. Um, and then coincidentally enough, ended up with my own disability, losing my hearing um, for four and a half, five years ago now in my left ear, um, which certainly brings about its own challenges. So now I really see myself very much integrated within the system itself, mm -hmm. um, as well as still on the outer advocating for and um, working for um, people with disability and providing these sorts of resources that we do through AAA. Mm -hmm. um, I am very grateful, I have to say also, um, and this might sound a bit cliche, but I am actually very grateful to be able to walk the walk now because for yes. many years working within the system, um, I always had that professional lens on and um, as much as you can have empathy for the person for their challenges that they face until you actually walk the walk yourself, it's very, very different. Um, yes. So now that I can walk the walk, I, I do feel that I can I relate and, and connect and draw upon that a whole lot more too. Yeah. Um, so um, I am very grateful, um, you know, in, in that way to have had that experience as well. Yeah, I think that probably really does give another layer of authenticity, but yeah. but also the compassion, doesn't it, that you can, yes. that you can, that's natural because you've had that lived experience as well. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that, I like that within you working within the system and also trying to nudge it from 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 outside the system. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Awesome, and that that brings us to the end, guys. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's been oh. a, a very quick uh, forty odd minutes or so. Um, but is there anything else that you'd like to 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 add? Oh, look, oh we've got an app coming out. Tell us. Talk about my Tell app. us about yeah. the app. Yeah. <laughs> So we're, um, we're currently getting some an upgrade to the app. It'll be available on the um, App Store and Google Play, I think, in the next coming months. It will be a summary version. Um, and then we're getting it out for the second round of testing, which will be with Access Key users. Um, the app will be free. It is a pocket version of our current Access Key, so you'll be able to use it in real time. How is and that? Um, so it'll be the biggest feature is um, the sensory guide. So you'll be able to hear the sounds and see the sights. And there'll also be a communication um, section of the app where our communication symbols will be touch activated. So you may not have English as your first language. You may be nonverbal or prefer not to speak in the public environment. Um, and you, to make a request, you'll just have to tap a symbol and the app will say it for you. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. And how, how long is, I'm sure these apps, you know, they don't just happen overnight. How, no. How, no, they don't. How, is, is this, I'm a picking, up, picking up a scab here, but how long has it, it been in development? Has it taken a while? Look, it's been over 12 months now, and I guess, yeah. like everybody says, COVID's put a halt to everything, yeah. um, and, and our workload too. So I guess when we were talking about our team before, um, Maxine and I have had the opportunity to work on the business rather than in it. Yes. Um, so that's made a big difference to not only the app, but also our online training, our do-it-yourself communication boards, which people can just hop online and 
um, personalise it themselves and then we'll send them out. So, yeah, most yeah. definitely. And, and yeah. big shout-out also, David, talking about our, our huge shout-out to our wonderful um, IT consultant that we've um, engaged with, Riz. Yeah. Um, he has now taken the lead on the um, app project yeah. and um, he is all things great when it comes to anything IT. Yeah. Um, so he has helped our business out immensely. Yeah. Um, so we're hoping now that this will force through, start to forge through a little bit quicker um, because um, yeah, having that extra pair of hands really, really helps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I think I'd just like to say keep doing what you're doing, guys. Mm -hmm. I, I love the values. Uh, I love what you're all about. Uh, and, you know, trying to give people that gift of time, I think, is, is such a wonderful altruistic kind of um yeah vision to have and i can actually envisage you guys having you know an access key being in every leisure and library yeah. leisure facility library and you know even having your access access australia um awards i think um each <laughs> each year but uh yeah so so thank you for your time and thanks for having us yeah thanks, it's, been, David. it's been great to chat and yeah, yeah wishing you well for the remainder of the year and hopefully we'll get a chance to meet in person someday maxine oh david don't even <laughs> don't even go there <laughs> for the you listeners out there david and i have attempted probably at least on three occasions to actually meet up in person haven't we and every we time something has got in the way yeah. um so hopefully one day david we will have that opportunity and both of us being northerners from the uk i'm that's sure it. we'll have a lot to catch up on when it yes. actually does happen yeah we will oh cool all right guys well have a great day and i'll catch up with you soon thanks so much thanks. for having us david you're welcome yeah, thank bye. you bye, bye. bye.